OK, so uh, welcome to my, my talk on module design and development best practices as they currently are in the, as the community understands it, or as a vocal part of the community, shall we say. Because if anyone has heard of Jaco or J Joel Bennett, he's one of the people who talks about this a lot. Um, and he's very, very vocal. You can hear him from probably here when he's talking in America. Uh, no, Joel. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, is my pen going to work? It should be working. Let's do this the old fashioned way. OK, so thanks to our sponsors. They're up. I want. Wee! Ta da! Fastest presentation of the day. <laughs> that's, that's my keyboard playing silly buggers, apparently. <laughs> Let's turn Bluetooth off, because that's, that's going to get very awkward. Uh... Let's try this again. 15th time lucky. Keyboard working. Let's do this. Touch screen, excellent. So yes, let's try this again. So thank you to our sponsors, um, all wonderful people. TechSnips are particularly cool guys. If you want to check them out online, um, they do really short videos about some uh, interesting technology across like the whole spectrum, um, and it's community contributors and all sorts of really interesting things on them. And I think they're like aimed at five, ten minute videos, which is nice and easy to watch. And Check out the other guys as well if you're interested. I, I'm not. I'm not sure I'm allowed to talk about DevOps groups since we're maybe competitors. Um, but yeah. So I'm Chris Gardner. I'm a DevOps and ALM consultant. Oh, I should probably take ALM off there since no one knows what it is anymore. Uh, I've been working with PowerShell for at least four years. I spend most of my time these days doing software development, uh, software builds, writing DSC, deploying environments with ARM templates. Uh, I contribute to DSC resources. That should ma I maintain two and a half of my own since I still wanted Microsoft since they couldn't be bothered publishing it for various reasons. Um, I'm on Slack a lot. Um, I'm on GitHub. Yeah, join us on Slack. It's great. So, quick agenda. Um, we're going to look at why we care about all of these best practices or good practices or whatever you want to call them. Um, we're going to look at function design. Uh, a bit on folder structure, about module structure, um, some talk about build scripts, and a quick overview of testing and documentation, because um, people would complain if I didn't talk about them. So the why, like, I'm sure we've all been to sessions about technology A or, or other thing that we're doing with the system, and a lot of it's about how we do it, what, when we did it, and the, the why is, is not necessarily often missed, but it's, it's not talked about enough, um, and I feel like you kind of lose something if you don't talk about the why. So the important one is we're technologists. I used to say developers and then had conversations with people, and developers does have that silo mentality to it. Um, yes, we are technically sort of developers because we're writing code and pressing save on scripts, hopefully. But at the same time, we're doing more than that. We're sysadmins, we're DBAs, we're doing all sorts of cool things with technology. And technologists kind of feels a bit more suitable because we're hopefully passionate about what we do and care about what we do. If you know, you're here on a Wednesday, you know, we're not doing work. So hopefully you actually care about what you do and want to learn more. So I quite like the idea of a technologist as a title, or not necessarily a title, but a descriptor is probably better, because yeah, titles end up with silos and all that good stuff that everyone hates. It makes it easier to contribute. If you follow a standard style or a, or a one of a, a number of standard styles, then people coming along to work on your code have a lot easier time. And if they're writing code, you don't have to, which makes means you can write other code or do other things with your time. And quite importantly, and probably most importantly, it's easier for people to use. If you follow the standard practices that the community and the PowerShell team and everyone else have put down there, 
it becomes so much easier for people to actually use the thing you've produced. If I write a, uh, this amazing module that it, how, you, how to use some random system I'm working on and no one else can use it, what was the point of me writing it other than saving myself a little bit of time? It doesn't really help anyone else. And we've got to give, give stuff back occasionally. So function design. Um, I assume we're all writing functions to some greater or lesser extent. Um, I can go on about the usual things of functions should only do one thing and they should do it really well. But hopefully we all already know that. But some, some, some key takeaways from this. Always include an output type. It's not hugely necessary, but if it's script analyzer complaining at you, that's one less warning that you have to deal with. And it makes it easier for things like get help to tell you what you're going to get back. So if I run get ad user, I know I'm going to get an ad user back because, well, the function's called that and the help tells me that. And Ryan's going to heckle me here with a, a random question. No, it's not a random question. I'm going to echo Chris's point about how Yes. Yep. If it does, if it doesn't, then you go to completely in the dark. Yes. Yeah. And if it. We make your own life a lot easier. Yeah. If you, and in fact, we even have to fill the custom type. Say, I'm returning something. I'll come back on the next slide. Um, so, yes. On top of that, write output or dollar variable your outputs. So they go into the pipeline. Avoid using return. It does interesting things outside classes and doesn't always do what programmers think it does. Um, and it will just return like loss potentially. But yes, yeah, so the output bar. Um, command and binding. There are very few cases where you want a non advanced function, and command and binding will help with that. Help the functions that you're not exposing. Yes, yeah. So that's the only reason I can think of not. Yeah. And command and binding makes life so much simpler. If I put dash for boss in, it'll just echo all the way down the tree, down to every single command I run within that function, which is really helpful because it gives even more useful output. And yeah, pipeline input. We all love the pipeline. It's one of the really awesome features about PowerShell. So support it. You know, we've all done get ad user dash uh, pipe to remove ad user because we didn't need that Active Directory anyway. <laughs> but being able to do that. It's great. So your, your sets, your updates, your removes should probably support pipeline input. Your gets can support it as well. But that's, you know, that's an option for you at some point. But the, the set stuff should probably support it. Pierce type name on custom objects is really, really useful because you can do custom formatting on stuff. You can do accepting only that type of object into your functions. Um, it's less of a necessity now because we've got classes. Because you can use custom classes on your things and do conversions into different types. Um, but not everyone wants to write classes, and they can be a little difficult to get your head around first. Um, but they're really, really useful. Uh, Fred. I'm not going to butcher his surname, um, did a really good talk at Summit this year about parameter classes, where you define a class as user and accept a whole diff bunch of different types into it, and it converts them into user objects. So your parameter is, yeah, your parameter accepts a user type, and I can give it a string, and it'll convert that into a user. Or I can give it a number, and it'll convert that into a user behind the scenes automatically for me, and it'll just magically works as far as the user is concerned, or the end user is concerned. Uh, but yeah, if, you, if you're in the sad state where you have to support all versions of PowerShell, classes aren't an option. 
So it's, it's 5.1, well, 5 plus, but please move to 5.1 if you're on 5. Um, and as we always say, naming things is the most difficult problem in, in IT and off by one errors. Um, so please use descriptive names. It's not particularly difficult. Well, it is difficult and it's not difficult at the same time. Like X isn't a particularly good variable name, is it? What the hell does X mean? But user means something more. Name, you should probably avoid using unless it's obvious what the name is. If you're dealing with two different types of things in your function for whatever reason, don't have something called name. Am I referring to this name or that name? And yeah, Com common names. If I go along to use a, a function and I do get, AD, uh, get, get service, I know I can do dash computer name and it'll talk to a different computer. So if I write my own function, I should use dash computer name if I want to talk to a different computer. Not in six. Not in six. Oh, is it host name now? No, they've removed the, a lot of the uh, remote thing. Ah, okay. The individual command that remote thing. That's fair enough, yeah. But still, still, if you're doing remoting, use computer name or that sort of thing. Sensible names so that it makes sense when people come to use your code. Um, so let's have a quick demo. This one, one thing on names, don't forget the standard verbs. Yes. Approved verbs, super, super important. Uh, this keyboard's going to be a problem, isn't it? So I've got a function here, uh, which I will try and zoom in because my keyboard doesn't want to work. Uh, This might take me a little while. Is that readable by people? Uh, well, right. So I've got this nice little function, get user data. It's not particularly doing much, takes a name, outputs a custom object. And with a bunch of useful data. So I've got a type name on here, custom user data. So I could write a um, a format file, or just update type data, to say how I should display this user. Maybe I don't actually care about displaying all of these properties all of the time. Maybe I just want name and email address. But now I can, I, I can use format data to do that. Um, so if I do, I can't type on this. Let's turn Bluetooth back on, Let's see if it breaks. Then what gods do not like me today. This is not a game. Go away. How is VS called a game? Anyway, so if I do. <laughs> <laughs> this is going well, guys. I think my Windows key's buggered. Uh, let, I don't want to use the. So let's just talk through this rather than attempt to type these things. Um, so, yes, I can get user data, and it will return me a nice simple object of just name, email, and computer. I then have a, a function called set user data, which as we can see, if I don't want to do that, accepts a custom object using my type name, or it accepts a string. So if I pass it a string, it'll go, if I pass it the name, it'll do something. If I pass it the custom object, it'll do something different. So I've got a process block here, because I'm accepting pipeline input. And if I'm past a custom object, change the computer name or do whatever my function should be doing on this object. If I'm past a string, pass it on instead to get user data first and then do the set user data on it. Uh, you, could do other, you could do the same sort of thing a little differently, but I figured why rewrite some of my code when I can just use my function I've already got and pipe it around a bit. Um, makes things a, a little more interesting with the, but yes. And unfortunately, I can't show it off because apparently my keyboard and my surface hate me. Um, so that's a way to handle pipeline input. You've got your custom objects in there with your type names. This could be a class, but I haven't written very many classes outside of DSC recent, for a while. Um, and yeah, there's some nice parameter validation. Well, parameter operator. On there, and again, command the binding because I might want to pass dash verbose into these and do give the user some sort of output or 
error actions or information output or anything else of that type. Um, so let's see if this is going to work. Okay, right. So let's talk about folder structures. Because organizing files is difficult. Because there's so many ways to do it. Now this is looking purely from a module level. We're not looking at a wider scope of things here. Just this is one module in one Git repository. Um, I, did, I probably should have said this right at the very start, but please use source control. If you're not using source control, start using source control. Things that run in production should be in source control. Things that run in test environments should be in source control. Your code should be in source control. Uh, are you getting that impression here? OK. So git ignore files are really useful. They tell me what, not, what I'm not going to commit, or not, what git's not going to track. In this case, my output folder, because if I'm building it locally, I don't particularly want to commit this code. I just want to keep all of my other code committed. Um, the VS code folder at the top, really useful for settings files, so I can specify what sort of settings I want to apply in my mod within the scope of this module, so where I want my braces to be, where I want, whether I want an empty line at the end of every file, and all of the other magical settings you can set in VS Code. Very, very useful to do that. My source folder is split into public and private, because I have public functions that I want people to be able to use, and private functions that I don't want them to be able to use very easily. There are interesting ways around that, as Jeffrey, Snow, uh, Jeffrey showed at the Unplugged session earlier this year. Um, but yeah, public and private, keep things nice and contained. Um, one function per file. And the file should be called exactly the same thing as the function's called, because then I know what's in that file. Um, some of the useful files, license file, if you're doing anything with open source, you need a license. Otherwise, people will not and cannot use your code. Uh, MIT seems to be popular at the moment, but use whatever's most appropriate for what you're doing. Uh, it gets a little hazy depending on IP and other things, but please put a license file in there if you're doing anything open source. Readme files, because having people be able to figure out what you're doing in your module is quite useful. Um, I've got a build file, which I'm going to go into soon, and a depend folder, a depend file, which is for PS depend, which lets me handle all my dependencies, mostly for build time, because my main dependencies are handled in my actual module folder, but things like Pesta, and I think I've got Platypus, Script Analyzer, and a few other things mentioned in my depend file, which I need at build time, but not at actual end user runtime. So any questions so far? Feel free to shout stuff out. Nope, excellent. Yeah. Catch. Yeah. It's got a microphone in it, apparently. Yeah. Ah, OK. Um, could you could you show the build depend file? I will show you that okay. uh, when I talk about build scripts sure. a bit later on. Yeah. Should I throw it back or? I, I would keep hold of it. Oh, pass it on to someone else rather than sure. me trying to catch things. <clears throat> With the split uh, one function per PS1 file yeah. and the public private folders, do you then create folder hierarchies in the in the public private, or do you just dump them all? Just, in? just dump them all in there because my module should be doing one thing, just like my function should be. I won't have an AD module doing DNS things. I'll just have AD module doing AD public, things. Within your public private, my point is you only you never go more than one level deep. No, nope. I've never needed to. Cool. If you have a lot of functions doing a lot of things within the scope of your module, then I can understand doing that. Like if you're doing, again, go back to AD because it's really easy because it's a giant thing. You can do have like an OU, a bunch of OU ones and then a bunch of user ones and a bunch of computer ones and that, that could make sense, yeah, if you wanted to have that extra level of organization. But generally, you don't. Uh, I've never had a module big enough that needs that. Cool. I would keep hold of it, because I'm, I'm not <laughs> going to attempt to catch that, because it will break something. So let's talk about actual modules now. The classic one is one giant PSM1 file. Um, I'm sure we've all seen it. I'm sure it's how we all start. We, we start off with this PS1 script with a bunch of functions in, and we just rename it to PSM1. And it's, it works great and it's super quick it loads in like 
seconds, uh, milliseconds, uh, it gets a little difficult to maintain, especially if it's in source control. Have you ever tried merging some of these giant PSM1 files? Uh, the, the classic example that I have that is quite useful is PowerShell GET. Everyone knows that lovely module. It is, oh, it was, about six months ago, 16,000 lines of code in a single PSM1 file because that's the way they dev it, so that's the way it was on GitHub. It, it's giant. It's, it is not pleasant to look at that code or, or manage it in any way. They fixed it, but yeah, it's, it gets difficult very, very quickly. Especially when you're trying to work with multiple people on it. So the alternative that lots of parts of the community have talked about, there's a ton of blog posts out on this, is dot sourcing. We all know dot sourcing is wonderful. You do dot and then the path to a script and it just runs that script in your current context. Great. Super easy to maintain. I've got half a dozen lines of code usually, maybe less in my PSM1 file. Um, if I want to add more functions, it's just make a new PS1 file, dump it in my functions folder in wherever it needs to go, and it just works. But it's slow, like ridiculously slow. Not noticeable here, because that's what, less than a second. Who cares about that sort of time? But that scales up a lot. Like that's, I think I've got 40 functions or something in there, nothing huge. Um, PowerShell get, again, wonderful example. They split it all out. They went for a dot source approach. Well, the person who split it all out went for a dot source approach. It was taking 12 seconds to load the module from there when dot sourcing it. DBA tools, I did some testing with one of their dev builds, which uses dot sourcing, was taking almost a minute to load the module on a machine which is an i7 with like 16 gig of RAM or whatever my, my machine has. That's not really feasible. Well, I, I don't mind occasionally going import module DBA tools and then waiting and waiting some more, but not usable every time you want to try and run it. And it impacts command discovery. If I do get command, it's now going to pass all of these PS1 files and do all of the dot sourcing things. It gets even worse when you start signing your scripts because I've got to sign the, the PSM1 and every single PS1 file. And then I have to do checks on every single one of those certs. So now it's gone from a minute to five, 10, who knows? I never tried that because I actually value my time. So the alternative is an interesting approach that a few people are suggesting. To compile is probably, is the right term from a dev perspective, but the wrong term from a sysadmin perspective. Um, and turns a lot of people off as I, as I keep discovering is, yeah, we take all of our PS1 files and we just put them in the PSM1 file at build time. Build, whatever you want. I, I'm gonna keep using build because I work with devs and that's the term they use. It's not the right term for most of the normal people. Um, so it's, it, it has the benefits of both sides. I've got a, a nice big PSM1 file shift to my customers and it loads really, really quickly but I have all these little PS1 files that are super easy to dev on and merges are easy. Lots of people are, are happier this way. The problem is it's a bit of a pain to start using because you have to have some sort of build functionality. But when you, you think about it, we're, we're doing automation-y stuff. Maybe we should write some more automation to handle that automation. I don't think it'll catch on, but it, it might do. Um, so as you can see, it saved me a, a, a ton of time on my example module. PowerShell get, again, same example. They went from 12 seconds dot sourcing to two seconds using this sort of approach. DBA tools are now down to five, 10 seconds or something to import there. 500 or something public functions, 70 billion uh, private functions. I'm sure the number goes up every time Rob Sewell mentions the module. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, Andrew can confirm that every session Rob mentions it, it's like, uh, now we've got 17 million functions and yeah. So that's an, it's a, it's a different approach because most people go from the large PSM1 file to dot sourcing and they see huge benefits because it makes their lives easier. But it doesn't necessarily make the lives easier of the end users. So we need to, we kind of need to take that extra step to 
I'm going to keep, again, I'm going to keep using the word build, compile, I don't know. There's probably a better word, concatenate, maybe, because we're just working with text. So with that said, some quick general good practice. I use good this time rather than best, because apparently I'm sensible sometimes. Version stamping modules. Unfortunately, we don't have Semver yet, um, but we can still follow their rough ideas of if you're making breaking changes, change the major version number. If you're making bug fixes or new features or just generally doing stuff with the module, change the minor version number. For everything else, revision is useful. That's just to kind of, I've built this module 15 times today because I kept finding problems with it. Please don't make breaking changes and increment the minor version number or release multiple versions of, uh, multiple different versions of the same version number. Once again, coming back to shall get and it's wonderful, wonderful things as there were at least three different versions of 1001. Or is Ryan gonna correct me and say there's four or five or six? I don't know. Seven, uh, seven different versions. So there's different uh, index identified builds. Yes. Um, increment the version number. So there's, there's actually something that, no, no sense of requirement that you need to pass that. Yeah. So yes, please increment version numbers correctly. We'll make everybody's lives easier. Um, I'm, again, coming back to my, my current dev-based work, I make sure my version in source control is 1.0.0.0. But at build time, I change that version number to whatever's appropriate. Because then if I say to someone, what, oh, you've got problems, what version are you on? And they say, oh, I'm 1.0.0.0. Well, you shouldn't have gotten out of source control. You should get in the build. There shouldn't be any difference, but I'm less likely to help them that way. Well, only a little bit less. I, this, this is super, super important. So I, I've done a project recently to take every single module in the PowerShell gallery, dump it on the VM, because I needed this giant VM for it, and strip out all of the help from it, uh, all of the commands in them, and dump them into a big graph database. I ran into a few problems, as you can imagine, when there are three and a bit thousand modules and 50-something thousand commands of importing these all into a single session. Did a bit of wizardry work around it. But apparently some people thought it was a really good idea to create their own functions with names the same as built-in functions. Simple ones like out default is my, my personal boot bear, which uh, anyone who isn't aware, at the very end of a pipeline, regardless of what you ever do, out default will be run. Even if you don't, have, don't run it yourself, it will be there. And that does whatever's necessary. Print to the screen, something else. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Proxy functions are the edge, I say edge case, the, 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 the exception, yeah. Uh, but otherwise, create an alias version because when you, weirdly, when you remove that out default from your, that module that contains out default from your command line, PowerShell doesn't go, oh, I've got one of those because it's in the snap-in version, not the module, so it doesn't auto-load it. And then suddenly your, your command line just doesn't work anymore. Everything you try to run is like, oh, I'm trying to pipe to out default, but it doesn't exist. And yeah, that, that ended badly and got me very angry and I couldn't quite narrow down who was, the, who was to blame for that one. So yes, aliases are, are your friend because when you remove the module, the alias goes away, but the original version of the, the function is still there. So let's get to the really complicated stuff, I guess. Build scripts. Um, these are nice and simple ways to Automate the automation, I guess is a good description. So invoke build and Sake are the two big ones in terms of pure PowerShell. They're just task runners. You give them a bunch of tasks, they do stuff. Um, we've got VSTS slash Azure DevOps, as it's called now. Uh, AppBear, GitLab, other sorts of task runners that have existed within the dev world for a long time. And the idea is you say, I want to do these set of steps in this order, and it'll do it. Much like all of the other automation we've written. In our case, or at least certainly in my case, I say take every single one of my PS1 files, grab all of the text from them, and put them in my PSM1 file, which is empty all of the time. Then, once you've done all that, which takes seconds, probably less, run all of my pester tests against that PSM1 file and give me the code coverage in whatever other metrics I care about. 
and then once you've done all that, run script analyzer against my PSM1 file. And hopefully, all of that passes, and I have a module. If my tests fail, I can go back and sort it out. But the important part, well, one of the many important parts in this bit, is that you're testing against the PSM1 file. Because if I run my tests against the PS1 files, they might work perfectly. But once everything's combined into a PSM1 file, it might break because I've got script level variables causing problems or things undeclared or any sort of other number of issues. And you know, if I'm testing the PS1 files, I'm not shipping those. My customer's never gonna see those. They're gonna see a PSM1 file and a PSD1 file, plus help and other things that might come with that. So if I'm not testing what I'm shipping, how can I know what I'm shipping is good? Like if, if my customer gets the code and goes, it's broken. You go, well, I, test, I run the tests, it works fine. Like, no, no, it's, it's broken. Like, no, no, I run the tests. It loses confidence in my abilities and my companies, which is quite important as, you know, Yes, James. Just a, just a quick one on, on those. When you've got multiple files that you've compiled together, yep. if you've managed to create a version on the top that uh, contains a function, contains a function that you test, yep. and you build something that's consistent with that function, yes. Not. When we, when we yeah. stuff together, it gives us something out of the loop. So the moral of that story is actually don't just merge the stuff together. Take it and run it somewhere where you, it's somewhere that you know you can stream. Yes, yeah. So that, that's one of the big things I have with all my build machines is they, they're completely clean. They don't have any of my mo actual modules I need installed. Like the module I'm building is not installed. I, I install everything I need at build time using PS Depend, which I will show you, I guess, now. Um, let's have a look. Uh, is this going to work? Yeah, of course it's not going to work. This part one's difficult. So let's have a look at the build script very quickly. So this is literally just a giant, li a large, large amount of PowerShell. So I do some simple things like making sure I've got PS depend installed. Really useful because it's going to handle my dependencies, which I will, again, I'll show you in a second. And then I find my module based on what the PSD1 is, making sure I'm looking for just the PSD1, because obviously if I'm using PS Depend, I've got another PSD1 plus some number of other ones potentially, if I'm using those configuration files. Um, I do a bit of grab me all, figure out where paths are, and then just sim very similar to the dot sourcing method of get me, a bun get me all of the files, and then just do get content, add content. It's, Quite a simple process, but with lots of extra stuff around just to make sure I'm getting exactly what I should be getting. Um, is this the latest version of this script? It is, excellent. So then, at the very end, I say, export all of my, ex use export module member to make sure I'm exporting all of my public functions, um, which I'm using some, some nice simple regex. That's not difficult regex for a change to find out what those are. And I'm ch I'm, for a change, I'm checking the actual name of the function, not the file name, uh, because I know what I'm like and I change function names more, than, uh, more often than I change file names when I really shouldn't, but yeah. Um, yeah, export them all and then update my PSD1 file to say these are the functions I'm exporting because don't use star. Of course, there's all sorts of problems with, again, load speeds and if you're using constrained or no language mode, star is not accepted. Your, function, your module will just not work. Um, and then I run Pester and Script Analyzer. Nice and simple. And because this is mentioned in my uh, JSON file, I can just hit F5 and, be, and it'll just run it all. And it'll all work. Or it usually works. I'm not quite sure I'm willing to demo that today. <laughs> my, my broken uh, thing. So PS Depend is quite a simple module. It takes a config file. You say what modules you want and if there are any specific requirements of where they go, that sort of thing. So I've said, install them all current user um, because if it's running a build machine, I don't want them splatting all over the system folders in case it causes problems like James has seen. Um, Pesta, I wanna make sure I've got the latest version. 
with its wonderful skip publisher check for reasons. I'm using Platypus for my documentation, using script analyzer, and then the last three are for what the module I'm currently working on. Um, but it's a nice way of documenting what requirements I currently have and what I need for build. So the last three I need for actually running the module, the rest of them are all for build time. Do I want to risk running my build? Yeah. Why not? There we go. Let's realize that. I don't have a network, so that's, that's fine. I already probably have all these modules installed. Yeah. Yay, that didn't work. I'm running as admin as well. Oh, well. So yeah, build script. I pressed F5. It, didn't build. Well, it built, but didn't build at the same time. I got a bunch of failing tests, so I know this isn't good enough to ship. That's, yeah. And I still haven't named, renamed that file. Or, or added the exception, because I don't, that shouldn't be failing at the point. But I can see there, uh, my, my life is now considerably easier, because I'm not having to, you, you can build this into your CI pipelines as well, but I can just press F5 locally, and it'll build and test. And that took 31 seconds to, to horribly fail. I think my actual build time's closer to a minute, but that's not too bad with the 200 tests I think I've got missed at the moment. That makes it considerably easier than, okay, I've, I've got my module, so now I need to copy it to a box that I can run it on, and then run it, and then, okay, I've, I've hit some problems. Uh, it was all right, that was just production AD I wiped out. Let's not worry about that. Restore from backup, start again. Yeah, and this moves, moves all of your testing well away from production, where it's much safer away from production, I'm sure. None of us really want to break that too much. Mm, let's do this. Which screens is going to work on? There we go. So that comes back to testing. Pester is your friend. Please, please write pester tests for just the simple things, really. Um, making sure your parameters are there is one I always do. Um, if they're mandatory, make sure they're mandatory. Let's just get command, the, mod, the thing, dot parameters, dot blah, blah, blah. Really simple test, because then if you go along and make it unmandatory, that's now a breaking change. Or if you make something that's not mandatory, mandatory, again, breaking change. Test against the, the compiled PSM1, and if you find a bug, or anyone finds a bug, write the test to prove that the bug is there. Then fix, the co fix it, and hopefully, the bug won't come back. Or if it does, you'll catch it before it gets shipped to production. Um, there's a whole bunch of really useful information on, on PESTA and testing in general now. It's becoming quite a, a big thing, thankfully. Um, there's the, the PESTA book on uh, Lean Pub, which is really good. Um, there's a bunch of really good sessions at Summit this year and PSConf EU. Uh, Glenn Sarty and Brian Bunky did some good sessions. Jakob did some really good sessions at PSCon for you, and he's the lead maintainer of PESTA, so he knows a few things about it. He's doing at least one session in Asia next week, which I'm sure will be really good. Um, what else was there on my, my wonderful notes? Mark's yeah. Session today. Mark's session today, good point. Uh, there's a session probably in here at the end of the day. Really good. Definitely go and see it if you don't do anything with PESTA already or want to learn more about it. It's really useful, and as Richard said, use it for testing anything. It's literally just PowerShell doing stuff. Can we just switch to testing? Yes. Before, yeah. Um, troubleshooting. Yes, yeah. So it, uh, OVF is the, the module. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of it. Don't. No. Um, I just like my normal PESTA just to do PESTA things. It's, I don't need extra wrappers on top of wrappers. I've played around with OVF quite well. Yeah. Or just run, roll, go to straight PESTA. It'll, my basic rule of it is, if PowerShell can find out the information about something, you can test it, because that's all you're doing, as, as Mark, I'm sure, will show you later. Uh, just to touch on that, yeah, somebody in the global PowerShell Slack asked about uh, some stuff that he's written in PowerShell tests. So if he's got a set of PowerShell scripts already, you can just convert that straight to PESTA tests, and that's yeah. all it is, by typing it out. It should be true, yeah. say if something is up. Yeah. Um, one last thing on, on PESTA. Be aware that it's been dropped from the C6. Yes. You have yeah. to install it from the yeah. 
which was a really, really good idea because shipping it with Windows was awesome because it was the first open source product shipped with Windows, but really bad because updating it needs, you need to say skip publisher check and other things because signing and, and whatnot. <laughs> but yeah. The last one that I'll mainly cover, and I know people will shout at me if I don't cover this, is documentation. It's really, really difficult, guys, because we really love writing code, and we hate writing documentation about code, most of us, unless you write lots of books like Richard does. Please write it. It's, Platypus is great for generating your MAML files because I don't know anyone who really wants to write MAML by hand. <laughs> Yeah. Get help. Uh, you know, we, we always teach people the, the, the three super important commandments you always want to learn is get help, get command, get member. And that's really useful for your end users. So if, if a user comes to me and says, how do I use this function? You go, well, have you run get help that function? They're like, no, do that. And then come back to me if you still have problems. So if you, and then hopefully at some point in the future, they'll, they'll remember that to do that after you've told them enough times. And then they stop bothering you about that. Um, and about pages are super useful for all sorts of more complicated things about your functions or just generally about your, func your, your module as a whole. Um, you can generate those with Platypus as well. If you haven't had, had a look at how many about files there are, do get help about underscore star and it will just tell you that I think there's, there's a lot of about files and they're really, really helpful. Some interesting talks on documentation are Michael T. Lombardi did an amazing session at Summit this year. He went into more different types of documentation than I knew were possible. Um, and lots of things you don't consider documentation are actually documentation. I definitely check out his session on, on YouTube. Um, Sergey, who wrote, who did a lot of work on Platypus, did a great session about it at Summit and PSCon for you, um, where he talks about Platypus and all of the other stuff he does around it, particularly doing some CI pipeline stuff with it as well, where as part of his pipeline, he'll check that any links you've got are correct, that you've, your spelling is correct, and that you've actually updated your help. If you've updated your function, have you actually updated your help? And if not, then the bill fails because you haven't updated the help to match what your function's doing. Um, and I think that's about all. So, any questions? I believe someone has the, the, the cube to throw at each other. Um, you were talking about uh, building the PSM file with all your yes. PS1 files. Yep. Did you try this with, uh, with classes? Also? I haven't, but the same process will work. The classes will have to go into the module first. Okay. Be so they're available further down. Um, you also have to make sure you're, important the that you're putting the classes in the file in the correct order, because otherwise if your classes depend on other ones, there's yeah. problems. There aren't any good solutions to that yet. Um, suggestions are leaving them one, two, three, and then the name of the class in the, like one dot class five or whatever. That's an option. It's not pretty, but it works. Um, there aren't, I, I know a few people are looking at doing things with the AST to pass all of the classes, figure out the dependencies, and then map them all over. That's going to be horrifically complicated and probably work brilliantly when it's done. It's just not there yet. So oh, um, I, I have a few functions that I'm using and they need some settings to store and it's easy when you just have some functions because yeah. you just go to the location where you are or something. Yeah. Now I turn this into a module, where do I leave the settings? Uh, in the same place, PS script root will, report, will be the function, uh, well the module location. Okay. So, but you've got a couple of options there though. There's, there's lots it's, of discussion it's, about... It's user defined settings, right? The and user... So, they, if you're installing, if, well, you can't assume the module's installing in the current user scope. So the few suggestions I've seen are to store things in the program data or app data mm -hmm. and store things there. Um, I think configuration, the module by Joel Bennett, handles some of that. I know lots of people have started putting stuff in that sort of location. Your other option to fall back to is Fred's PS Framework module, which does tons of configuration stuff plus 50 million other things. Um, it handles settings in the registry, just stores them there and you can read them out of there. And it's in a scope that you, the user has access to. Cool. That's, that's certainly an option. I know 
DBA checks uses that. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, settings are difficult. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you mentioned a few different um, build tools yes. for assembling the module. Do you have a preferred pipeline? Uh, uh, I use BSTS because yeah. that's what we use internally for all of our stuff. Even for my external stuff, I use it because it's a nice tool. Mm -hmm. But if you're already using GitLab or like AppVay is free for open source, but so is VSTS now as of yeah. two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Um, use whatever you're already using internally. Otherwise, use whatever's free. It's probably the best option. It does all of the things you want it to do. Um, one of the big things people suggest invoke build and SAC here back for, particularly R, they don't care what you're running them on. It's just mm -hmm. PowerShell. Um, I haven't moved over those yet because it's highly unlikely I'm ever leaving VSTS unless they do something really badly. Fair because enough. it's it does everything I need it to do and it's free. So I have a bunch of custom stuff in there already. But yeah. VSTS, app VR, or whatever you use internally is my general suggestion. Bonus round. Yeah. <laughs> um I'm trying to develop some tests with some PowerShell code at the moment that's manipulating the current time and doing oh. functions depending what the current time is. Okay. How would you pester test the current time if you'd like to run some tests to say what will happen if it's midnight? How are you getting the current time? I'm doing get time and translating to UTC. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head how I would do that. Uh, I would probably, well, you should probably be mocking get time anyway. Yeah. And then returning the sort of time you expect and then doing stuff based on that. Um, That's kind of what I figured, yeah. yeah. Generally, mocking is the way to solve most of your external dependency-based problems or things like that. Where, like, I don't know what time this test is going to run at, so I need to do something. That's it. Yeah. And I, I want control time. Yes. So that in which case, yeah, mocking is the solution in that yeah. situation. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I think there's a few people at the back there. If you want a, a large box thrown at them? Thanks. Uh, you mentioned format files and data types. Yes. Do you separate those out, or are they just one big file for each? I would probably put them in one big file to start with and then start separating them out as needed and then probably collapse them down again at build time. But I don't at the same time, I don't particularly want to deal with compressing XML files in, files in one file, which would be probably very awful. Um, I haven't played around with the former files for a little while, but I know in the conference book, uh, Graham Beers did a really good chapter on format files and format data and stuff. So it's he probably has something to say about it. If not, tweet him on, uh, on Twitter, strangely. And on, I think he's on the PS UK Slack. Me message him on there, and I'm sure he's got some, some good solutions to, to the okay. format files. And the other one, any advice for, so the module versioning is fine, but when it comes to individual PS1 files, is there any better way to version them rather than just sticking it in the notes? It goes in source control. You don't need any other versioning than that. OK. Yeah. But again, all, all your code, it goes in source control, and that handles all of your versioning for Whatever. Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, a module that uh, has a couple of commandlets and functions at the same time in it. And do you have any tips on uh, how to properly build that and export uh, members? Um, ooh, an interesting one. You'd probably build it in a similar way to this um, with some Visual Studio Builder, MS Builder, or something to do your compiling of the commandlets and then write a custom function or something in your build step to pass that, 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 those compiled commandlets and figure out what they actually are and add them to your commandlets to export. Similar to how I do with functions to export, you just do add that DLL, what was in that DLL, export it. Assuming you want to export all of them. You could also yeah. pull that from part of your build run. So you could do that, pull out the information that's in your CS files. Because you, you're defining it in those files anyway, so you could do it, do it as part of your build task. And then you would uh, use uh, nested modules to import that DLL. Yes, yeah, you could do it that way. Yeah. Uh, anything else? If not, catch me, I'm around all day. More than happy to talk about anything related to this. Uh, that's my contact details. Um, there is also supposed to be a slide in here about filling in your forms and, and whatnot. I apparently lost it in this version of my PowerPoint. So, so we're going to just give you all a, a feedback form for this session. There will be one at the end of the day as well. So we can give you pens, you can keep pens for the day. Um, 
and we're just going to give you feedback on nothing major, just just so that we can like, get some feedback for Chris. Got to get every little bit of swag you can. Tell him how bad it was. That's how, how it wants to be. Thank you very much. Thank you. I hope, hope it's been helpful.